have fought a fight for us, Lord God. You brought us out of the dark places in our lives, Lord. You planted us firmly in the kingdom of your Son. We're grateful. We'll ever be grateful, Lord God, to you for that. We look to you tonight, Lord God. Hear our cries. Hear our prayers, Lord God. Touch hearts and lives tonight. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray.
God, we ask that you would have your way in this place tonight. Let your greatness be made known, Lord God, to your people who are gathered here tonight. May our hearts rejoice at the great privilege that we have of meeting with you in this place. Hearing your word preached and taught. Open our ears, open our hearts, that we might give you glory and honor in every way, every conceivable way. Be glorified in our lives, we pray. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord, you may be seated. Do you have any prayer requests this evening? Yes, John. Shoulder. Okay. Pray for your shoulder. Your neck. Jim. Uh, my younger son, Luke, he's been going through a rough season. It seems like a couple of years now. And he's dealing okay. with some anxiety with depression lately. So I okay. can't remember him. And then uh, I found out Friday that my, my son-in-law was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Oh, no. Son-in-law and your son. Anyone else? Yeah, Amy. I have two. One is for Gracie's mother-in-law, Lynn. Lynn. She has bone marrow cancer. Oh. So it started at like breast and it got that. And then now it's bone marrow. But anyway, she's just been struggling. Her hemoglobin needs to get up there. She's having okay. blood transfusions every week. And okay. she'll start chemo here um, next week, I believe. Okay. So that's the first one. The second one's a little but I got a uh, text message from Gracie, uh -huh. and she was very upset because the baby wipes that she gets at Costco, there was a recall on baby wipes because they're cancer-causing. There's a chemical in them. Oh, weird. So okay. not only prayer, obviously, for her yeah. children. Right. She says, I've been using yeah. these for three years, yeah. and, and now there's this recall. Yeah. Why they're putting that kind of junk in our especially the kids yeah. stuff. So, you know, a prayer okay. just in general for that. Absolutely. Important deal. You don't want that. Anybody else? All right. Yep, sorry. It's for Richard. Richard's arm. Elbow. Yeah, they think he's got bursitis. bursitis or whatever, so they're trying to make the orthopedic specialist right. Okay. Don't do any big weightlifting with that elbow, okay? <laughs> Lord Jesus, here we are. Lord, we know that there are so many needs that we can bring to you. And Lord Jesus, we know that you can minister. We ask you, Lord, to continue to minister to the needs of the year. Father God, I ask in your mighty name, you touch John, help him lower the shoulder and his neck, the pain, the difficulty that he's been having there. I ask you to just ease that whole part of his body that he might have just uh, freedom to do the things that he wants to do and, and, Lord, not have to suffer through that. God, I ask you that you'd be with Jim son Luke. Lord, he has had problems with housing, with vehicles, with jobs. He's tried real hard. He's a good kid. And, Lord Jesus, life just has been really bumpy for him lately. And I ask you that he would hold on to you, that he would not give up, that he would not start thinking that you don't care or anything else, but instead he'll hold on. And, Lord Jesus, you would open up opportunities to him so that things can be a lot better from here. Lord, bring strength to him. I ask you that you administer, Lord, to his daughter Katie's husband, who's been diagnosed with uh, multiple sclerosis. Lord, I do know there are different types of multiple sclerosis. None of them are fun. None of them are pleasant. We ask you to heal all of them, whatever might be true in him. But, Lord Jesus, we ask you that even the diagnosis might be one of the ones that are less scary. And the Lord Jesus, things can move forward as your healing is made manifest in him. We ask touch Richard, Lord Jesus, that you'd help him with his bursitis. God, if that's what it is, whatever's going on that's causing the pain and the swelling, we pray that the orthopedic surgeon will have something good and easy and the schedule will work out so it doesn't get in the way of the wedding or anything else. And Richard's body is just made whole. 
Lord, we ask you to minister to Lynn Lloyd, Lord, who's been struggling with breast cancer, now struggling with uh, bone marrow cancer. How, how incredibly serious that is. Lord, I ask you that you hold her hemoglobin up, that the, the bone marrow would do what it's supposed to do. That, Lord Jesus, you would just cause that cancer to be destroyed in the mighty name of Jesus. That Lynn would find hope in you. And, Lord Jesus, what, what happens will be a turnaround in her story. She's been sick now for a while, and we just ask you to make her whole. And God, I ask you that you'd be, Lord, with Gracie's kids, that, Lord Jesus, both of them, there'd be no threat, Lord, that they don't have any cancer, they're not going to get any cancer, that whatever went on with these baby wipes, Lord, was, was taken care of and it wasn't an issue for them. Lord, we don't want anybody to get sick, but I just pray, these are the ones we know about, so God, I pray there's nothing wrong with them. I ask you to be peace, Lord Jesus, and Gracie's heart, and help her to know that you are there for her, and you're going to take care of her needs. Lord Jesus, for any other need, I think of John Sakachi, who, Lord, we continue to ask you that she would come all the way through this process. The Lord, we're glad for the heart working better now with the stents. We ask you to bring her all the way out the other side of all of the trouble she's had with autoimmune diseases and, and um, RA problems. And Lord Jesus, we just ask you that your healing would be there. Lord, we ask you for wisdom. We live in bumpy and difficult times. And Lord Jesus, uh, we see things that we, we really deal with here in the book of Proverbs. Lord, about honesty and integrity and moving forward. Just lots of stuff that's there. And God, I ask you that, Lord, we live out these things. Because it's one thing to yell at somebody else that we don't think does it. We ought to make sure we do it, Lord, the, the way that we should do. Not because we're trying to earn heaven, that we can't do that anyway, that's your grace. But because, Lord, wisdom literature says this is where life has li lived best. This is where good stuff happens. When we live out these characters. So, God, I ask you these characteristics to be developed in us. We thank you for all the goodness. We ask you to continue to touch Lieutenant Rob, Father, as he's continuing to heal from this hip replacement. Lord Jesus, we ask you, I think I was talking to uh, Don before service, and he has a schedule for a knee replacement. God, I just ask you that you would work on his behalf. And Lord, help him. He was limping in the hall, and I pray that you'd ease the pain and let them be able to re just replace that knee and let it be good from this point forward. We thank you and praise you in your mighty and holy name. Amen. Well, we've had so many announcements and things going on lately, and I will say we're kind of coming to the end of, or the kind of end of a busy season. I understand we were going to have the Salvation Army Black Party on Friday. That has been canceled because of weather. Um, I did hear today that there's like a 60 plus percent chance of thunderstorms and rain and everything else. So, so we got a, a cancellation on that event. Um, which the joke was, of course, I, I had someone, anybody here ever have scheduled themselves in two places at once? <laughs> have you figured out that, that you can't do that? Because what usually happens to me is I, I know that Stephanie said, will you, will you be in the dunk tank? Sure, I'll do the dunk tank. Then somebody said, aren't you supposed to be downtown selling ice cream? I don't know how to do both of those things at once. So I, I probably would have had to like, let somebody dunk me as a ceremonial dunk and then run wet downtown and sell ice cream. But I don't have to be in the dunk tank anymore, so I have to sell ice cream. So if you're not getting thunderstorms or lightning or God knows what else, and you're out Friday, the Rotary selling melon ice cream, if you like melon ice cream, right on the courthouse lawn. So it's there for you if you'd like. All righty. That's the main example. And then if you had decided you wanted to go on the mission trip and you have not given me a uh, application yet, and some of you have, thank you. If you've already done it, don't sweat about it. But if you haven't, please let me know because I have to fax them all or email them all to him on the 19th. So I appreciate that. So we want to make sure we know what our team size is and what we can accomplish. All right. The 20th. Yes, John. I believe we do. Yes. Correct. Wally's up north? I hope Wally enjoys his up northness. Okay. <laughs> good. Good. I'm glad. We'll, we'll cover it. We'll get through it. We'll be here. So, so show up. It, it'll be awesome. All right. 29th chapter. And Dr. Nichols will be here this weekend. Morning service, we do have a 6 o'clock service. I know some of you are going, what? What? How many of you know normally we don't have a 6 o'clock evening service? We, that's like one time a year. Uh, maybe two times, three times we have worship nights. We can do that. But not we don't do it very often. So save up your sleeping hours. And most of your kids aren't in school yet. Some are, but, but maybe some aren't. So, so come out and be a part of that 6 o'clock. He usually wraps it up by about 8. It's going to be a great time. We'd love to have you come out. 
29th chapter, 5th verse, actually 6th verse, right? 7th verse, we're already through the 7th verse, okay. The righteous considers the cause of the poor, but the wicked does not understand such knowledge. Why? Don't care. All right. If you're righteous, what's, I know I say this word all the time, but we, it's confused in our language. What does it mean to be righteous? That word is a specific word. If, what's that? To be in right standing. What did you say, John? Good intent. Okay, I, I like the fact that good intent is a starter, but how many of you have ever had good intent in bad performance? So I'm not picking on your answer, John. I'm just saying, right, it's the beginning to something positive, and then sometimes our, our execution can fail. To be in right standing, as Jim says, really what it is, okay? And, and, you know, we say we're living according to the principles God has given. Now, there's going to be another verse here just in a little while, but how many of you know that God does care about poor folks? He does. This is not just a political thing. I mean, if you know that both parties on occasion can make uh, uh, motions in the directions of poor people to try to harvest votes one way or another. Trust us, we will send you the checks. And, and I've seen both parties do it. That is not, yes, more the D's than the R's, but both parties do it. So, so in this case, it's good to take care of the poor, but if you're taking care of the poor for your own benefit, have you missed something? Give a man a fish, teach him to fish. He'll, you're on the right track, right? You just want to give somebody something, you want to transmit skills and abilities. So there's different methodologies for it. But you're trying to help somebody because they need the help. Because God finds value in people, no matter what their socioeconomic problems or situations are. So we never want to be in a situation where we only look at the wealthy or, or you know, and think somehow they're blessed and God loves them more. Not true. You're in right standing, you take care. But a wicked person doesn't even understand that. They're into what they want. Very true. Is there anything in the world that you've ever wanted? How many of you know that wanting is not a bad thing? It depends on what you want. It depends on what you're willing to do to get what you want. Those could be bad things, potentially. But desire in and of itself is not wrong. The wicked person says, though, that I want what I want. I don't care what I have to do to get it. At some level, that's what happens. And so they're not worried about being in right standing with God. They're worried about accomplishing the thing that they want to accomplish. And they're not going to make a lot of room for the poor except to advance their own ends, which is, again, not good. Next verse. Scoffers set a city aflame, but wise men turn away wrath. We've heard... Similar verses. There were so many verses as I was reading this tonight going, oh, the news is just, just copying things. Um, I told you before, I used to live in the Twin Cities. I used to live five blocks where all the nightmare, the, the police precinct that got captured and the fires. I lived five blocks from that area. I know it quite well. Okay, even though I haven't lived there for a long time, I remember what it was like at one time. It wasn't nice when I was there back in the 80s. It's not nice now. But how many of you remember that a governor actually told all his people to stand down while that part of the city burned and people rioted? And he's vice president nominee of one of the parties for the United States. That's a problem. Scoffers, people that say, I don't care... I don't care what happens as long as my stock goes up, as long as my people like me, as long as whether it's more votes or more money or more stock shares or whatever you're after, I don't care what destruction and what agitation is caused in society. I'll even stir some of it up if necessary, if it's going to make... How many of you realize that that is not righteousness, that is actually wickedness? That's problematic. Now you can say, well, that's not fair because I like that. Well, that, that doesn't matter. The person I'm talking about caused the problem in the neighborhood that I had lived in before. I can tell you that wasn't pretty. And Minneapolis has not thoroughly recovered from that even a few years later. It's a real problem. That stuff has been happening all over the United States, hasn't it? That level of civil unrest. Do you have that in Australia at all? Or are people pretty cool most of the time? 
You have it too. Okay. So and then they do in the UK. They just had all kinds of riots in the UK. There were problems in Canada, all over the English-speaking world. We got some real issues going on here, and some of it is right there. Remember, scoffers are people that say wisdom doesn't matter. How many of you remember back to the day when the parties were not that far apart? Right? I mean, you kind of, one side was management, one side was kind of labor, and they could argue about that, but, but people still believe that there should be families and that people should get along and that cities shouldn't be burned. And, you know, there was still some kind of, I mean, I'm not saying they were all saved, but there would know, be some kind of common sense that, that united the mature at some level, even if they had different paths to get to what they wanted. And these days we've kind of thrown that away in defund the police and open borders and this and that and the other thing. And sometimes even, like, let companies do whatever they want without any limitations. I mean, you know, that's kind of the, the Republican side. That's not helpful either. You got to have some kind of balances, right, that says, are we watching out for people? So, and again, I know I'm skirting the edge here, but we don't want to be scoffers. We want to be people that look to God's righteous principles in, in terms of who we support and what we do. Wise men turn away wrath. Hmm. Okay. I was thinking of this with another verse. Um, yeah, I'll get to it when we get to that verse. It'll be easier. Next verse. A wise man contends, if a wise man contends with a foolish man, whether the fool rages or laughs, there is no peace. Kind of an incomplete translation because the contention involved is contention in court. How would you like to go to, to court with an idiot? Now see, I put that in a specific word, right? This is actually a foolish man. Remember, a foolish man is somebody that does not live within the, stand, the standards and boundaries that God has set. So if you were to go to court, is there anybody that's ever gone to court with foolish people? Can you win, really? Well, yeah, the judge could rule in your favor. A jury could rule in your favor. That, that's true. But have you ever noticed that in the U.S. things get delayed and delayed and delayed and appealed and reappealed and... It can take years to solve an issue. You know what this verse is really saying? If you're dealing with a foolish person in court, cut your losses, get out of it. Don't keep pushing. You might say, this is a principle and I will not bend. They will not listen. They will continue to cause problems. If you can't get the solution that looks like you need, cut your losses and go. You say, well, that's not right. Why would I do that? Remember, this is wisdom literature. How many of you know that there are times, anybody here ever owned a lemon? I mean, not literally the, the fruit, but a car. <laughs> I've owned a lemon! It's the best thing ever, right? I love lemons. How many of you like cutting lemons up and stuck, sticking them in your mouth? And sucking, oh, well, salt, that'd be interesting, Richard. And like sucking all the sour out of them and smiling. You have the lemon peel. If you've ever done that kind of lemon, that's a good lemon. Lemon meringue pie, that's a good lemon. Four wheels, lemon, not a good lemon. That's a bad lemon, okay? Um... Can you get it repaired? Yeah. Yes. Does the repair always work? No. Is there ever a point you say, I'm not going to throw good money after bad? Mm -hmm. Now, there's laws. I know there's laws in Michigan. You try to go in three times to get the same sort of thing repaired. Eventually, the dealership has to buy it back. I get that. But sometimes you cut your losses and go. You ever been in a relationship you can't seem to make it work? Doesn't have to be a romantic relationship, it could be a work relationship, whatever, right? And it is not working. Are there times you cut your losses and go? Can you love that person? Yes. Can you pray for that person? Yes. Are you going to stay around that person? Probably not. That's not a really good idea, right? I mean, because it just caused pain and damage to you. So there are times. Now, here's the difference. If God tells you not to run. If God tells you to stay in, in that relationship, if God tells you to stay in that business issue, if God tells you to stay supporting that person, should you? Yeah, yeah. if you're pretty sure you know that God said that, that it's, it's a principle, it's there, you feel it, then don't run away. Hang in there and trust God for strength. Stand for a principle that you're supposed to go or not. That's true. So you think about all the stuff like with the right to life, right? Have people gone to jail? Yep. Will that sadly probably continue to happen? Yep. 
but you got to be able to stand and, and do that. I remember my dad looked at it from a different perspective. He goes, it's not that I mind so much going to jail. His problem with, with abortion issues was, unless I'm willing to take that child into my house. And at his age, he says, I'm not, I don't know if I am. You know what I mean? But how many of you know that if you're willing to make any stand, whether it's legal trouble or economic sacrifice, that's the way to do it. You say, I will stand anywhere and I will not leave this hill. I will plant this flag and fight for it. Okay. There are things to fight for. Sometimes you're dealing with fools, though, and it won't help. Next verse. The bloodthirsty hate the blameless, but the upright seek his well-being. Have you ever noticed that one side always hates the other? What's that? Um... With, yeah, I'm going to get myself in trouble. When's the last time anybody owned a slave legally in the United States? It's been 160 years. Does anybody have a parent or a grandparent or even a great-grandparent that had one day of slavery? No. The oldest among us might have great-grandparents who were children when freedom happened. Was that a terrible thing? Yes. Is it excusable by any modern standard? No. I understand that. But to still hate and be angry 160 years after it's over, is it helpful? It's not. Right? It's not a good thing. There are people in our society right now who would love to cause the church to disappear. They don't like the fact that you exist. And I'm not a big preacher of fear. I'm not. You know that, right? I don't go around and say, be scared and hide under things. And I don't believe that that's what God caused us to do. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Amen? Yeah. But there are people in the world, in all countries, that have lifestyles that hate you simply because you tell them God isn't approving of their lifestyle. Does it matter what they can do legally? It doesn't matter how much social approval they get. The fact that you exist at all is not acceptable to them. If they can program your kids and your grandkids and take them away from you, they will. If they can limit you legally or economically, they will. The fact that you exist with an opinion other than cheerleading them is unacceptable. How many of you know society can't work that way? Just can't, right? It's not a good thing. So the bloodthirsty, no, that's not just one. Anybody that says, I am going to do what I am going to do, and the fact that you don't like what I'm doing, I'm going to be your enemy. That's kind of the principle behind that. The bloodthirsty, in this case, would be people who are willing to do wickedness up to and including murder. Okay? I heard a new one. Maybe you saw this. There's a new, prince, a new pronouncement made that abortion is safer for a woman's health than having a baby. How many of you saw that roll out in the news today? That now they're saying it's a safer health option to have the abortion. Really? Considering all the problems in history. See, they hate the fact that anybody would stand in, of it against them and say, not the best idea. There's something better. Let the baby live. Can't stand that idea. All kinds of problems that are, un, that maybe they weren't exactly the same all those years ago, but the stuff goes on over and over and it never really changes. Next verse. A fool vents, oh, here's my verse I wanted. A fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. You ever get pulled over for a traffic violation? Richard never has. God bless Richard. <laughs> what, what is the wisest thing to do when the officer comes to your window? Keep your mouth shut. When they say, hands on the steering wheel at 10 or 2, what do you need, officer? How can I help you today? I want the documents. They're over there. Can I get them for you? Now, it's funny. You're looking at me like, you know that far too well. <laughs> the funny thing is I've never been pulled over. Now, watch. It'll happen someday soon. And I'll be like, oh, I've never been pulled over for speeding. I have been pulled over for taking turns I didn't realize I could couldn't take at that time, right? But whatever. I mean, it just doesn't... Should you yell at the officer? What happens if you do? <laughs> you get 
malice greed, right? Back in the day, you have flashlights are whipping on you. It's not good. I mean, if you do that, how many of you know that if you're polite to them, most of the time, they will be somewhat polite to you. They might give you a piece of paper that says you owe money and you have to show up at such and such a place and you don't want that paper and neither do I. But they're probably not going to throw you in the back of the, uh, the car and take you to the crossbar Hilton. They're probably not going to do that. Okay? So, but when you get mad, then they can charge you with resisting arrest. They can charge you with public you know, violence. All kinds of stuff and complicate your life. What if it's not a cop? You ever been cut off in traffic? Now, if you got that, I'm going to make an assumption. If you say yes, how many of you say yes? I have been cut off in traffic. Let's see your hand. Anyway, anybody here never been cut off in traffic? Ever? See, we've all been there. So good. How many of you know that sometimes you did the cutting off and you didn't even realize you did? Yeah. I don't care how good a driver you are. If you've been driving any length of time, there's been some time when you were not attentive, somebody moved in a way you didn't see, and you cut them off. And you didn't kill them either. Yay! All things work out. So if you're in your car and somebody pulls, you know, cuts you off, and I had a drunk literally run me all the way off at 23 a while ago. I mean, I was like, ah! And <laughs> trying to just get out of his way. How many of you know you're just lucky to be done with the problem? Let him go. But we have something, I was going to say, the song just kicks in, doesn't it? I have, grand, I have granddaughters. Let it go. Um, how, many, how many of you know that, how many of you know that um, chasing the person down, rolling your window down, yelling and screaming at them, you get your gun in the face, it'll get you a fight. You, but road rage is something that is a problem in our society, isn't it? We don't have, it's not a competition, you don't get a gold medal for it. The best flipper offer on the road does not win a medal. Right? What's that? Flipper offer. Flipper offer. There you go. But a fool says, I have to. I have to. I have to tell you. Anybody? I know this is this is wrong crowd to talk with about this too. I know. None of you have ever had a fight with a, with a spouse, have you? Anybody here that's been married, have you ever had a disagreement? Now, of course, all of your disagreement with spouse have been polite, logical, right. right? And you laid out your points, and they laid out their counterpoints, and then you decided between the two of you which points won, right? And everybody went out to dinner afterward, got ice cream. Yeah, right. <laughs> How many of you have ever heard something was said, and all of a sudden all your buttons have just been stomped on? And, and you know, even if you, you, you're not slapping and swinging, hopefully, but at the same time, you know, your, your anger can come up. Has that ever happened? I'm seeing some, some nods. Yeah, right? We're talking good people, people who love Jesus Christ. You're not awful folks. But have you ever noticed that that can lead to frosty, uncomfortable, difficult problems for days or weeks or years sometimes in the future? I have actually, none of you, not here, I have actually dealt with couples in the past where their fights go back decades. And they're still together, but they're still ticked at each other. And it's like, why? Well, she said, well, he said, why? A fool vents all of his feelings. I just gotta tell you what I think. <laughs> okay, John. I was on the expressway and I was, I was getting on uh, I-94 and it loops around pretty good going down the ramp and the speed limit's 25. Okay. So this, this guy came barreling up behind me as I'm going around the curve and he's blowing the horn at me. I'm doing the speed limit. So as I get down Go. And Telling I, you you're number one. Yeah, right. And I did, and I did one of these. <laughs> Give him a sign of the cross. Oh, was he mad? <laughs> so, so some level of restraint is literally a survival tactic, isn't it? You know, it doesn't matter how mad the cop made you, the government made you, your spouse made you, your employer made you. I can't tell you the number of people I've heard in my life, I told that no good lousy boss that I'm out of here. 
there. Well, great if you have another job. A little tough if you've got a mortgage payment coming and you no longer have a job. It might be good to have a plan. So a wise man learns to hold them back. That does not mean that the wise man is always a doormat. That means the wise man, the wise woman, is in control of himself or herself and looks for a moment and an opportunity. Yeah, and looks for a moment and an opportunity to respond in an appropriate way. Keeps yourself out of shootings and problems and fights at home. It's a good idea. Pride gets in the way. True. If you had to go to a gunfight, how would you like to be the unarmed man at the gunfight? The reason I ask that question is the, if you think and your pride is the motivator, if your anger is the motivator, how many of you know that you're not thinking with all the right data? You're not. No matter how smart you are, you may be an absolute brilliant individual, but under pressure, especially that kind of suddenly put upon you, emotionally laden pressure, it is so easy to miss all the turnings and just do some really, really dumb stuff. And you don't have to. Just learn to keep the mouth closed, right? That, that count to 10. Now, I, what's that, 20, 50, whatever it takes. I, and, and, and I can tell you, even as I preach it, have there ever been times that I have, yes, there have been times I have shot off my mouth because I'm as human as you are. And I wish I always clearly remembered this before I have. Because I can tell you, even though I've never, you know, cussed out a cop or, yeah, never had, no, I, I tend to be pretty conservative. At the same time, I have said things I wish I could roll back. Okay. Not only to the other person, but to God as well. Yeah, that's good, Mike. If you don't like it, find a way not to have to. Well, it sounds good. I'm not saying I'm a good person. <laughs> okay, okay. All the time. All right. And, and this really gets at an issue, and I will get off this verse. This verse is a really important verse, and it really impacts all of us. I don't care where you live or what you do. We are in a, in a society that tells us over and over and over that our feelings are of crushing importance. Can I be honest? Most of the time they're not. I didn't say your feelings aren't. I said my feelings, our feelings are not. Feelings are valid. Expressions are not always. Right? You can feel hurt. You can feel afraid. You can feel offended. And the fact that the feeling happens, okay, nobody's here. No, I don't have the right to look at Roy and say, Roy, your feelings are crushed. I can't do that. What you choose to do based on those feelings, what I choose to do based on those feelings, that may be crud, that may be sinful in fact, right? Because I have a choice as to how I choose to express myself. I don't always have a choice immediately in terms of what I might feel. But I have a choice as to where those feelings go. So you. Next verse. If a ruler pays attention to lies, all his servants become wicked. Now there's a phrase that kind of goes behind this, that the courtiers, you know, those who serve the king, tend to be like the king. They attune themselves to the king. Why? What's that? Keep their heads? Keep their heads? Yeah, you, you, you want to live. You also want to profit from your association, right? You not only not want to die, you want to do better, get money, get power, whatever it is. That's why people hang around rulers, whether they're elected democratically or they serve by right of birth, right? You serve, you're around these, how many of you know there's lobbyists all around whatever the president is? All around whatever the congressperson is. In fact, that's the aim. You've really struck it rich. If you can serve in Congress for a couple of terms and then be a professional lobbyist for the next 30 years, that's where the real money is. But in this case, if the ruler starts saying, I will accept lies, I will accept falsehoods and propaganda here, everybody will start giving them that. That's a problem. 
you really, really want to make sure that the people making the decisions, I'll catch you in just a second, Mike. The people that are making the decisions want to get good data, even if they don't like the data, right? I mean, it's possible for a ruler to say, my party, my philosophy, my ideology does not fit that data. But if you have lies for data, you will make bad decisions even using what you think is right. You have to know what actually is happening on the ground before you make a plan. Mike. Yes. Explain it again. Okay. Yeah. I'm slow. So good for you. Yeah. Okay. So I can I can misjudge other people by the force of those lies. Okay. okay. And Tim is a great guy. <laughs> so so make sure we get that. Yeah. You're right. But. But think about it. We Again, we live with that in this country right now, don't we, too? Again, a lot of the stuff just fits the news. When, now, now, that goes both ways. I, again, I wish I could tell you that only one side's presidents uh, you listen to lies. Only one side's congresspeople listen to lies. Not so. It is so easy. Again, I talked about lobbyists. How many of you know lobbyists have learned to lie about everything? Everything. And as soon as you buy that, you have all kinds of problems. You want a good illustration of that? How most nations decided to deal with COVID. If you want to take a vaccine, that's great. I have no, I've, I've taken lots of them. How many of you have done any foreign travel? You've had to take a lot of vaccines, right? It's just part of life. And there's nothing wrong with them. Vaccines are not evil. I'd rather do them than get sick. I've seen yellow fever. Don't want it. Thanks. I'll take the shot. We're good. But how many of you, when the government starts forcing you to take X, Y, Z, X, this is a problem. And then it's amazing how after you're doing all this, people were saying, eh, no, it's not right. I don't know. This is going to work. And the government, no, 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 everything's cool. And then all of a sudden afterwards, it's like, um, yeah, well, there are these problems. And it's funny. Yeah, we'll sell them for three years, and they're fine, and now they're not fine, right? It is amazing the number of things. I mean, follow the money. You know, you can usually follow the money, and there you're going to have a problem. If wickedness is accepted, if lies are accepted, you're going to have a problem. Next, the poor man and the oppressor have this in common. The Lord gives light to the eyes of both. Again, we all have the same gift of life. God didn't bring intentional misfortune to the poor person. I mean, you know, God didn't have a quota. Oh, I have to have 43% poor people. Your luck. No. God gave everybody an opportunity. Now, government might not. That can happen anywhere. Economics might not. But how many of you know there's all kinds of story th stories throughout human history of people who even from poverty or ignorance did all right. They used their, their abilities and their skills and their contacts such as they had and their discipline, we'll get to that in another verse, to make something positive happen. The Lord gives light to the eyes of both. I think it's so easy to say, I'm here because God put me here. How many of you, God didn't put you here? There's a lot of things I don't understand even as you're looking at me. And I mentioned it when I talked about divine healing. How many of you know good people who have died? Yeah, so it got killed. How many know we live in a broken world? We just do. And good people get sick. There are people who don't do bad things, irresponsible things. But here's a, everybody dies eventually. It's appointed unto man once to die. Here's the interesting thing. Are there two people in the Bible that supposedly didn't? Who? Elijah. Enoch and Elijah. Now, can I promise you that this is true? I cannot. But it's funny the number of scholars that, that associate, how many of you have heard of the two witnesses in Revelation? Yeah. A, lot of, a lot of scholars say that's got to be Enoch and Elijah. They never died. They're going to come back and get theirs. <laughs> can I tell you that's true or not? No. I just thought, it's so, it's so, 
ubiquitous, right? We all live, we all die. There's actually good reasons for that. Can you imagine living for the next 10,000 years? How many of you would get to the point you'd be bored out of your mind and you'd have no idea whether anything could ever be fixed? We've tried it all. It never got any better. The fact of the matter that we don't live forever gives us a... That's why I think it's so cool to watch young people go, let's try this, and it works. And you go, wow, I would have never done that. Right? There actually is some sort of an odd blessing to mortality, as hard as it is to lose those that we love. So we all have those opportunities. Next verse. The king who judges the poor with truth, his throne will be established forever. Is other than politics, is there no, no, I said this earlier. Other than politics and God's favor, and God's favor is the really important thing. Is there any economic value to supporting the poor for most rulers? Okay, if they're working and paying taxes, it's better than if your money's going out. Okay. But my point is, is it easy to support the rich? How many of the rich will pretty much support themselves? <laughs> it's amazing the amount of government support that the rich often get. Corporate income tax cuts and this and that. Again, I'm not against those things. I'm just saying those come pretty regular, right? Because they stimulate the economy. They do this, they do that. It's not wicked, it's just a thing. If the government didn't help them, how many of you know they're smart enough to hire the right people? The right accountants, the right, you know, the right lawyers, the right folks to move it forward. Can the poor do that? In most cultures, not. Maybe sometimes in the United States and other places there are agencies that will help. But most of the world, and I've been in other places and so have many of you, the poor have nothing to go to. They have no one to help them. And you realize that many revolutions, many problems that happen within countries come from poor people who see no better option. People say, i got nothing to lose. Why not try? And here we have this picture of the king who actually judges. Now, judges doesn't mean do whatever the poor want. But the king is fair and open and applies the rule of law properly to those that are poor. They don't attack the poor to benefit the wealthy. And then the poor won't rebel against them. Yeah, you, you basically got that group anyway. They know that you treat them fairly. Okay? So treating the poor, judging them, the, the opposite is not just give them everything they want, because no country can afford to do that very well. Even ours. It is what it is. The rod and the rebuke give wisdom. But a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Anybody ever been in a grocery store with a poor mother with a kid that's just a hellion? I have been that mother. You have been that mother. Okay. Now, I'm not picking on anybody. I mean, if you're here and you've ever been in that situation, what I want you to hear is not, Pastor says you're bad. I feel bad for that parent. I don't know. Maybe that parent is great and disciplined. The kid is just taking their opportunity. There are people around. What you going to do now, mama? You know what I mean? That can happen no matter what it is. But at the same time, the rod and rebuke, those are correction. We have a weird culture right now. This idea that no kid needs correction. That it's unfair to bring correction. That you squelch their little personality if you give them correction. That their desires and their will and their pleasure is what they need to have. Or they will have a bad childhood. It'd be very easy just to show my age and go, Pfft. But, there's another side of this. How many of you know that the word that lies in underneath correction is discipline? Discipline. Correction might seem harsh. Discipline matters. What taught you discipline in life? Rod. <laughs> the rod. Too literal. You got spanked. Me too. Being pulled over enough times. Being pulled over enough times. You don't want to do that again. I, I look at it Ernie here. Ernie was a lineman for a lot of years. Now, not the current neighbor I have, but the one before that actually worked at the Howell, you know, where you had the lineman here for, for DTE. And, and he knew about you. 
He goes, Ernie's a legend. <laughs> and Larry goes, he, he goes, I've only been there like 10 years. He goes, Ernie, I don't remember his name. Ernie was a legend. He goes, did you ever have to go out when it was cold? Windy? Rainy? Hail? Why would you do that, Ernie? I mean, I mean, that's a legend. I, now, think about it. You're going up on a big zappy thing that can send you home in a box. And the weather is horrible. And, I mean, I, 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 hopefully they paid you well, but I'm sure they didn't make you an instant millionaire with every paycheck. No. So why would you, why would you do such an insane thing to go up there and become a legend? Why would you do that? Okay, you realized you were doing benefit to the to people who had no power. Why else? I'm sticking them on the spot. I didn't tell them I was going to do this. Okay, I agree. And, and, and you're good at those things. I was literally telling Greg today, he was out, how I many of you know that we're working on the front of the church and making that, you're trying to make that better and it's going to look real good when it's done. And they were trying to get the stuff up to soften it. And I literally told the story of you being in Jamaica, 30 feet over a pavement, hanging underneath, working on a light. He's holding out of the roof with his knees, hanging underneath a light and rewiring it. And I'm thinking, I'm not even going to say, hey, Ernie, how's it going? Yeah, I'll kill him. I just don't have to leave him up there. Okay. Dedicated focus. I can tell you the reason that you did it. You loved the people sitting next to you. Right? And you were able to provide a life for them and you took care of them. And that takes discipline because how many of you how many of you just know that it'd be easier sometimes to, to run, to do anything else, to accept public assistance, to do whatever you have to do. Don't work, don't do that. Why would you go out and do that? Because you're a disciplined individual. Not because somebody had to spank you. But you learned early on, this is what it takes to make a living. That's good. Ernie, that's good. How many of you know that a lot of people in the United States have lost that? They've lost that idea of discipline. Now, maybe that has to do with the fact that the rod and the rebuke are on, on, on the wane pretty badly. But discipline says, I can do this thing. Has anybody here ever heard about the, what the Marines do at the end of boot camp? It's called the crucible. They get almost no sleep for a week. They're out in the woods. They're packing stuff. They're doing this. It's insane. The point is to push you way, way beyond anything you think you can physically or mentally do and reset the needles for you. So you say, I can do more than this, which makes the U.S. Marines one of the most feared combat forces in the world. Because you learn that discipline takes you way beyond what you want to do or what you think your limits, your talents are. You can adapt, improvise, and overcome. That's what you do. Sitting on our duff with our Coca-Cola and our Doritos, which are two of my favorite things, does not bring discipline into your life. It just doesn't. It means that you are less capable to handle the things that you need to deal with. I was thinking of one more illustration, and I'll roll past it. This is a reality that we live in. How many of you went to college? Now, I understand. I'm going to have some young, I've had young people tell me before, including one of my own children who didn't go to college, but told me this. How many of you remember back in the day when you could work your way through a college degree? You could do that. It was, it was financially possible. How many of you know that in any big college now, you can't do that? I agree, you can't. You cannot work your way while you're in school and come out at the other end with no debt if you're trying to do it on a four or five year schedule. You can't. Can you do it afterwards by a lot of debt? Yes, you can. But I'm just saying it's very, very hard. If somebody's not paying the bills up front, it's hard. Okay. Discipline teaches us that college is a business decision. Do you realize that? It's not a rite of passage. It's not a place to find a date. It's not a, just a way to make money in the future. It's a business decision. How many of you have ever made a business decision? Bought a house, bought a car, had a credit card, bought anything. How many of you know there will be a bill to pay? Okay. I was taught that. How many of you were taught that when you went into life, whether you went to college or not? Today, people say, pay my college off. I can't get a house now. 
did you pay any attention to the documents you signed? I literally had my youngest son tell me, they just told us we had to go. I said, you didn't. Well, because he was trying to argue for paid off college loans. They just told us. You ever been on a used car lot? What do they sell you? <laughs> do they tell you you need one? Do they tell you they have one? How many of you know if you're in the education market, they sell education? They're going to tell you that's what you need. But you still have to decide whether you want it. There's nothing wrong with a degree. I'm not attacking degrees. I have one. I'm glad I have one. But you have to decide before you buy the house whether it's worth it. You have to decide. Discipline, mental discipline, financial discipline, tells you I am going to do this for that. We live in a world where people think somebody else should pay that bill. That doesn't work. Again, it sounds like I'm just picking on people politically. Not my point. My point here is just that doesn't make sense. Are we going to pay off everybody's car loan? If so, I'm going to go get an Aston Martin DB12. And you can pay for it. And I'll be the coolest pastor in hell. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense, does it? It doesn't make any sense to do all the other things. We want to be people who understand that there's value to discipline. It brings wisdom. Like the Marines, it stretches us past. A little spiritual illustration, and I promise I'll move on. I'm sure nobody here ever struggles with praying in a focused manner for a longer time period. We have some amazing prayer warriors in this church. I am always impressed with what they do. But I do know that there's a lot of Christians, people who honestly would say, I love Jesus and I'm saved and I know what that means, all across the United States that don't pray a lot. How many of you know polls say that, you know, five minutes, ten minutes a week is the prayer life of a lot of people? And most of that is, thank you for our food. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's not a lot there. Okay, how do you ever get better at that? Practice. Discipline. I'm going to take this time. I'm, I'm going to focus. I, what do I have to do? Make a list. My pastor used to want us to do prayer at 6 a.m. I don't do that to staff. I like them too much. But he loved being up early. And I noticed that every time, I know I've told the story before, every time I tried to do the bow down, I was snoring. I, I'm sorry, 6 a.m., I was the farthest guy away. I had to get up at 4.30 to get there at 6. I, I was just sleeping. I said, that doesn't make any sense. So I literally would walk around and try to pray. And I ran into stuff. I mean, because our church had stuff like this too. The program. I ran into stuff. I tripped over stuff. But eventually, I could do it. Discipline. How many of you have ever used discipline in your life? Good. So you understand the value of it. It's not easy, but it's always of value. A child left to himself, that's a disaster. Not going to work out well. Next verse. When the wicked are multiplied, transgression increases, but the righteous will see their fall. Now, the first part of that makes perfect sense, right? The easier you make wickedness, the more people will sign up. That's just human nature. The second half is a little tougher to deal with. And here's why. How many of you want the wicked to get their just desserts now? <laughs> Me too, right? How many of you know that some people wait an entire lifetime and it doesn't necessarily happen in their lifetime, in their eyes. Right? God always brings the wicked to justice. Always. One way or another, maybe at his throne, but he always does. But we tend to want to make that happen in our world, in our time, so we can see it, doggone it. And we do not always get that benefit. Sometimes the wicked will be wicked long after we're laid in the ground. And yet God will take care of that. And that reminds us, is it our job to bring the wicked to justice? If you're a prosecutor, a cop, I, I guess you're part of that process on a human side. But it's not really our job to go out and get them sinners, is it? Other than to bring them to Jesus. In love. In love. So God did not send us out as judge, jury, and executioner. And, and the first part about judging, how many know God does expect you to make spiritual judgments about people? What? 
How would you know whether somebody is saved or not if you have no idea, no conversation? Do you evangelize them or do you just assume they're good? What does it mean not to judge? Judge not, let you be, lest you be judged. What does that mean? Yes, looking at somebody and going, you're going to hell in a handbasket, and there's nothing you can do about it. I, I'm convinced that's God's business to make that call, not ours. Right? But the world has kind of warped that into never, ever be critical about anything anybody does. I'm sorry, that's stupid. There are people who do things that are destructive to themselves and others. And sometimes they need to be stopped. But there are ways to stop them, and me going and yelling at them is not probably going to stop anything. So I need to trust that God can handle the eternal issues that they may face, but I have to be able to at least show them, like Proverbs, a better way, right? So do you. We can't even share our faith if we don't understand there's something better that all of us can walk in. We would have no ability to share our faith. We would be totally locked up. So, not judge for hell or damnation, but definitely allow the wicked not to increase so easily and be patient and understand that God will take care of the ultimate thing. Next verse. Correct your son and he will give you rest. Yes, he will give delight to your soul. Now, again, could that go with a daughter too? For sure. Correct your child. Maybe we say son, because how many of you have ever noticed there is a time when the boys are a little, a little bit stronger willed. I said a time. Yeah, boys. You have some boys, right? They ever stronger willed at some point? Is there ever a time when girls are stronger willed? <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, is it, how, how many of you, and I love her, she is, I don't want to say my favorite child. We're not ever supposed to say those things. Alyssa is the, the, the one of my children who's the quickest to call dad, the quickest to keep me in the loop. I, I, yeah, I love talking to her. She's awesome. I love my boys too. But, but you know, she's just the one that does that effort to, to stay close to me, and, and I appreciate that. And how many of you remember when Alyssa, and I used to say Alyssa is the poster definition for strong will? Look her up in the definition. They're right there. Right in the, the dictionary, there's her picture, right? I mean, she wasn't a horrible kid. But she was my strong-willed child. Isn't it amazing what age and maturity can do? And suddenly they turn into these wonderful human beings. You're so glad. So there's a time when it's your son that might be doing it. Age is about nine. How many of you ever had a nine-year-old boy? It's like Katie barred the door, right? You have no idea what's going to happen next. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and then that kind of flips. And then sometimes the girl can do it later. But correct them, and they'll give you, and you'll have rest and delight to your soul. But if you let that monster go on and do whatever he or she wants, you are going to have problems. Next verse. Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint, but happy is he who keeps the law. Where there is no revelation, if you don't think God speaks to you in any way, what changes? Oh, I like that answer. I wasn't looking for but that's a good answer, Kathy. Nothing. Why would you change? If God's not going to talk to me, he has no opinion about what I do, why should I have to change anything I do? Okay. What happens when a church starts to believe God doesn't talk to them anymore? It doesn't grow. It perishes. I've used this I know, illustration before. How many of you know there are churches who literally believe that the Bible is a human document that should grow with the culture. <laughs> there you go. We should constantly reinterpret it to fit the culture that we're in. Well, if you don't believe God ever talks to you, then why don't you rewrite it? I mean, if it's just Jimmy Joe Bob on the side of the hill who wrote that book, you can rewrite it. Good for you. But where does it stop? Where does the rewriting and the cultural interpretation, what happens to the church? It starts to die. It starts to die. I've used it because it came from there, the United Methodist Church. It fell, just saw the spreadsheets today, oddly enough. It had fallen 40% in number of churches and members before the conference where they jumped into the full world thing. And it's falling faster now. Why? Why would anybody go to your church if you don't believe God spoke and has any opinion? Why would you bother? How many of 
you like the fact that you know that you can approach God? That you can pray and he listens? That he speaks to us through scripture? It's important. And you don't have to even be here to get that. Or be in your church in Australia to get that. Right? You can be in your car. You can be at your house. And you know that the Holy Spirit is touching you where you are. You have revelation. So because you have revelation, you say, there's certain things I don't want to do. There's certain things I understand that God has expressed a specific opinion about, and I won't do those things. That's a good thing. Happy is he who keeps the law. Somebody asked me one time, we're almost done. This might be the last thing. Somebody asked me one time, what happens if when you die, you find out there is no God or no, and no afterlife? Well, first of all, if that happens when I die, I won't know it, will I? <laughs> I'll just be dead. I right? won't be thinking about it at all. You won't be able to brag and I won't be going, darn, because it'll be all over. But how many, even if I knew, I lived the way I thought I should live. I, I tried to do the things that worked, the things I thought made God happy and that worked in the right way. I don't regret anything. I don't. I, I'm not sitting around going, don't go to make sure I could have had that one more sin. No. I blow it and I mess up and I do dumb things, but I try not to. I try to hold on to God's grace. How many of you are there? You're not doing this because you're better than somebody else. You know better than that. You live with yourself. You know better than that. You are a sinner saved by grace. But even if all of it was junk, the life that you live so far, you've done what you wanted and needed to do. See, I think it's a blessing. I think it's a neat thing that if you follow God's principles, you're blessed. Even if you just read the book of Proverbs, and you never got saved and never knew Jesus, you'd still go, you know, that wouldn't be good from an eternal perspective, but how many of you know your life here would be more orderly and productive? You'd be blessed here if you just did this part of it. Hmm. And what if that person finds out the opposite? Oh, yeah, that's, see, that, yeah, that, that is, uh, was it Pascal's wager? Yeah, yeah. It, so, so, the best, for the atheist, the best you can do, if you're right, is you're just done. Poof, you're done. I lose nothing. You lose everything. Right? If I'm right, you're doomed. That is not a good thing. So we want to make sure we get that right. So I'm going to stop right there at verse 18. Lord Jesus, I am glad that you give us revelation. And I am glad you give us revelation in so many channels. Lord, I, a long time ago I realized that you speak to people in way more ways than a preacher talking. And I am so glad that you do. I am glad that this congregation can read their Bible anywhere, that they can pray and talk to you and hear from your Holy Spirit anywhere. Lord, I'm glad to have a role and glad to be a teacher, but I'm not their only teacher. Lord, I'm not the only person that can speak into their lives. And Lord, they are able to speak into each other's lives because of your wisdom and your revelation. Thank you. Please keep doing it. I certainly believe you will. I think it's your plan. Lord Jesus, I ask you that because we have that security in you, because we know who you are, Lord Jesus, we find that we are less worried, less anxious, more able to move forward, more able to see. We believe we're going somewhere by your goodness. Not by our effort, by your goodness. And that should change the way we interact with the world. God, I ask you that you'd help us. In your precious and holy name. Amen. Melissa is your favorite daughter. <laughs> That's a good way to...